Hey, hey, hey! Can anybody see me this time? Let's see if this is a little better now. Hopefully. I see myself here, so probably now it's a little better, but uh, yeah, but, but it could probably go wrong again. Um, of course, <laughs> you remember one of the first slides that I showed you is we could have technical issues and probably the main technical issues that we are having now are the fact that I'm using this OBS platform on Linux. And apparently the OBS platform on Linux is a bit unstable. Um, I'm sorry for that. I should probably stream from Windows or from Mac but currently on my laptop I only have Linux and uh, I have to stick with that. Uh, apparently OBS is, is thrashing, which means that it starts consuming all the CPU, it's looping in some uh, strange uh, calculations that it's doing and um, the computer starts heating, I hear the fans and I have to kill the process, which is a good way to uh, rehearse uh, some of the things that we already discussed about. So, for example, um, how did I kill OBS? I said kill all dash nine, because this is the uh, option that tells kill forcefully OBS. If I do this, the stream will end immediately. And this is a very convenient way for me to kill an application that is not responding without using the graphical user interface. Okay, so now it works for everybody, right? Please tell me as soon as there's any problems with the stream again. I'm really sorry for that. I really, really hope that, I don't know, future versions of OBS or future versions of Linux will solve these problems. Or otherwise, I will probably, I don't know, switch to Windows or I will try my, my best. Okay, so that was one first technical issue. I still have some uh, uh, messages going on. I see 11 viewers, the stream is on, so probably I can start right away. So, <laughs> I, was, um, I was already saying a couple of things. Windows Master Race, not hearing any sound for me. Oh, okay, really? Um, but I think that um, Bobby hears me because he replied to something that I said. So, yep, so PNTM, uh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to write to PNTM because if uh, he cannot hear me, probably I cannot he give him uh, oral advice. My bad, I didn't turn up the player volume long. Okay, okay, that's cool. Okay, so uh, speaking of technical problems, uh, one other huge technical problem that I experienced in the past two weeks and I realized only after last lesson was that I completely lost that feature that allowed me to show the chat um, on the side of my streams. And this is because, again, it's an issue that we have between OBS and Linux that prevented me to include any web browser um, windows inside of the um, of the scene and uh, so the last two streams that I have just have a dark rectangle instead of the stream chat which is really really bad uh, luckily every message that you send I read it out loud so probably people that are looking at the recorded um, the recorded stream are not losing any message at all. But still, I don't like that. So I found a workaround which is uh, keeping open this kind of chat here and including it as the as a window capture. If this works, better. If this doesn't work, I will probably try another way. But this probably seems to be working for now and uh, let's hope. So I was saying that, <laughs> oh my god, Today is the 21st of November and this is the sixth lesson, lesson number five, because we are counting from zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. Six lessons starting from zero. And we are going to talk about HTML a little more in detail. But first, before that, 
I would like to continue a little bit with Git, telling you uh, uh, something that is a little more advanced, and it's completely optional, so uh, feel free to relax. Um, Rachel is the only person that has problems in, the, in uh, reaching us uh, at this time, so um, I'm doing this also for her because this is optional and she doesn't lose uh, she doesn't skip too much of the of the le of the important part of the lesson. So what I wanted to tell you is this. Um, I hope that you saw a little bit of learn Git branching or what was that. Um, it was a fun game. It was a difficult game, and uh, as I already told you, it's not um, it's not enough. You have to try branching by yourselves. In fact, there is one aspect that I don't even know if it's covered in this um, in this game, but I think it's uh, worth covering um, in in real life, and it's about conflicts. So, conflicts arise whenever you have two commits that have changes inside of them, of course, and the changes involve the same file. So, if you did, if you perform two changes in parallel, one in one commit and one in another commit on different stories of the git uh, log, and the two commits uh, involve changing the same file. So whenever you need to merge those commits together, what happens is that git will probably try to guess what is the result of merging. And usually the result of merging is pretty trivial, because if you have a file that is, I don't know, 10 lines long, and one commit changed line number two, and one commit changed num line number eight, well, then the resulting com merge commit will probably be one file with line two changed and line eight changed. So it merges both changes inside of the same file. But what happens instead if you change the same line on the same file. So what is what should the results of the merge be? Should I give credit to the first commit or should I give credit to the second commit or should I include both changes somehow? This is something that Git doesn't know. So Git gives us the ability to tell it what to do. And this is something that I would like to show you because it happens a lot. It happens if you are working by yourself in multiple branches. So you do parallel commits and then you have to merge them or rebase them together. And it happens also if you're working with a team because another teammate could work on the same file that you are working in his local copy. And then this teammate could push the commit and you pull it from the remote server and now you have a conflict because you are trying to merge his commit or her commit with your commit. Okay, so this is still a problem with concurrent modifications on the same file that generates conflicts. And it's an advanced topic. Uh, the cool thing about uh, our lessons is that the only things that you, sh knew, you should know about Git are Git clone just once whenever you need to create a new repository from remote. So you create it on GitHub and then you clone it locally. And that's one command that you just do once or uh, a couple of times during the during this academy and then you just need to well change your files git add git commit git push these are the only three commands that you need to know and to use every single lesson because whenever we write code we want to push it on our remote repository but still, if you are curious about um, how Git works and a little bit of how command line works, I prepared something for you. So what I wanted to create is uh, a situation that is probably very similar to what we see in this game here. We've got initial commit, which is C0. Then we've got a second commit, which is C1, that, uh, I don't know, creates a new file or something like that. And then we have two concurrent modifications, so two concurrent commits and in two different branches, and we want to merge those branches. But this time, we've got a conflict, because those two commits have a change that is performed in the same line of the same file. So I would like to show you what happens and how to deal with this conflict, but I would, sh I would need to create all these 
all this commit structure, which is pretty annoying. So you know what? I pre-cooked the solution uh, beforehand, and I'm going to show you a cool thing that mixes all the knowledge that we already have on Git and a little knowledge that we haven't uh, acquired yet about the command line. So I'm going to my projects folder in Glorious Coders Academy, and here I created a file, a file called Git Good which is in honor of Bobby, because Bobby is one of the most committed students that we have, and uh, he tried the Git branching games way before last lesson, and he told me that they were pretty difficult, uh, even more difficult than the Soulborn games uh, series that he's a master of. I don't believe you, actually. I think that the Soulborn uh, game series is pretty tough and I, I would probably have more problems with that than with, uh, with Git. But still, since you're a master of, uh, um, of the Soulborn series, I created this file called Git Good, which is what we usually say to people that are not good at the Soulborn series and they cannot um, pass uh, some, some of the bosses. In fact, if this academy was a game, and yeah, it actually it is, uh, well, probably Git was your first boss. And uh, don't worry, <laughs> thank you, I'm flattered, says Bobby. Um, so, this is your first boss. So, don't worry if this was really, really tough for you. Bosses are supposed to be tough. If you're still having problems with Git, feel free to reach out to me and we will try to solve these issues together. But in the meantime, I will going to show you this file, gitgood.sh or whatever. If I nano git good, you will see that it's a text file. And this text file starts with uh, something that you probably never saw before. This is called a shebang, just like Ricky Martin's song. She bangs, she bangs, oh baby, when she moves. Okay, so this is a shebang, and the shebang is some sort of preamble just like in HTML, it's a preamble that we put in executable files to say, hey, there is a program that should read all the following lines and interpret them and execute them. What is the program? Well, the program is bash, in, in my case. Bash is the terminal that we are using right now. So I'm just saying in this preamble here, in this uh, shebang, that or shebang or hashbang i'm going to show you that it has multiple names uh i don't know for historical reasons probably in computing a shebang is the character sequence consisting of the character's number sign and exclamation mark at the beginning of a script it is also called shabang hashbang poundbang or hashpling Okay, uh, but if you read on Wikipedia, it's going to tell you pretty much what I said, but in a more formal way. So you are telling what interpreter is going to interpret your file and execute it. And you can use multiple things. For example, you can use sh, which is the, uh, the shell, or you can use bash, which is the born again shell, which is a... Uh, enhanced version of sh or you can even use python or whatever you can even use this strange thing bin false which will probably exit immediately from the from the program by giving you an error etc etc i'm not going to go into detail on this because it's not really interesting for our purposes but still this is the shebang and then you will see that there are many lines that you already know what they are and some lines, I'm going to explain them to you. So, for example, first line is make dear get good. I hope that you can see the, the, the words because the colors are pretty difficult to, to tell. Uh, it's um, some colored syntax that I haven't chosen, but still, I hope that it works for you. So, make dear get good. This creates a new directory called get good. And then cd git good, so it goes inside of that directory. And then git init, which initializes a git repository. You know all of this, right? So these are the three first lines that create a folder, get inside of that folder, and initialize a, a repository. Then, this is something that you haven't uh, saw before. Uh, echo hello world. If I try to do this um, on the terminal, let's see what happens. Echo hello world. This just prints hello world on the screen. 
So echo is the way that the shell uh, prints something that you prefer to, that, that you wish to, to print on the screen. And using this greater than symbol and the name of the file will create a file if it doesn't exist and it will replace completely all the contents of this file if it exists already with whatever we type in here. So echo hello world will take this string of text, will create a new file and will just put that string of text inside of the file. It's uh, the automatic way to, well, create a file, open it in a text editor and write text inside of it. We can do this in one line automatically. Then, you know all of this, git add everything, git commit with a message of initial commit. So as you can see, we can automate the adding and the committing of the files. Then I'm going to do a little more. I'm going to add another string, but as you can see now, the greater than symbols are two, not one. And this allows you to not replace the contents of the file, but to append the contents of the file. So you're not replacing, you're just adding more and more lines, okay? And now we're still adding and committing. So, so far we created a situation that resembles the first two commits in this tree because we well we created the repository then we created the first commit and then we created a second commit on the same file and this is not generating any um, any conflicts at all of course because we are just uh, changing the file progressively uh, through the history of our of our development but then Look at this. I'm going to check out dash b a new feature. This, if you remember, is one command that does two things. It creates a new branch called new feature and it switches to that new branch. It checks out into that new branch. So now I'm in the branch new feature. Now I'm going to append uh, some other text in the same file. So I'm appending she sells seashells on the seashore, tongue twister. And I'm adding everything and I'm committing the tongue twister on the file. So now the file should have hello world on the first line, add some more text on the second line, and this she sells seashells on the seashore on the third line. But this was on a separate branch, on the branch new feature, which could be very similar to this other branch, bug fix C2 that we have here. And then we switch back to the main branch, which is called master, and we put another tongue twister at the same line. So the other tongue twister is the shells that she sells are seashells, I'm sure. So now we've got two different branches, one which on line three has she sells seashells on the seashore, and the other branch that on the same line has the shells that she sells are seashells, I'm sure. Which is difficult to say, but yeah, I practiced. So now we've got this kind of situation in which we have two different branches with two changes that should be in conflict. So what should I do with all of this writing? Well, I could copy everything and paste it on the terminal or I could execute this command. I can execute this command if this command was, if this file was executable, but it's not. In fact, if I do ls-l, I will see that git good is a file that is readable by everyone, it's writable by myself, the owner, and my group, but not by everybody else, and it's not executable, which is the default permission set that every file has. So usually when I want this file to be executable, I use chmod, which modifies the modifier, sorry, it changes the modifiers of this file, and I would say chmod plus x on git good. Plus x means that git good, th this file, will be executable by everyone, by the owner, by the group, or by everybody else. If I remember correctly, you can restrict the modifier. For example, user will just be able to execute, the group will be able to execute, but if you don't type anything, it will just be executable by everyone. Just like directories, directories are executable by everyone. 
So if I press enter now, you will see that, oops, ls-l, git good now is green for some reason, and it's executable by everyone. So now I can execute this file. Okay, now everything is in place. So I'm clearing everything, and I'm going to show you how to execute this file. Well, in order to execute the file, since the file is inside of this directory, I have to call it just like a local uh, relative path. So I'm going to say, starting from here, git good. This is how you execute a local file. And if I do this, bam, it did something. Uh, we can see uh, some of the output, which is actually the output that git provides. So it initialized an empty git repository. We knew it. It created a new commit. It created another commit. It switched to a branch called new feature. It created a new commit on that branch. It switched back again to the main branch, master. And then it created another commit. So apparently the output that git gave me is promising because it looks like it's uh, exactly what I wanted. But is it true? Let's do an ls and I see that there is a new folder here called git good, which is the folder that I wanted to create. So I can go inside of that folder git good and check it out. I can do a git log one line graph and let's put also an all since we learned it last time to, to see everything that it's happening. Oh, okay, this is exactly what we wanted. We have the initial commit, we have the second commit, and then we've got two uh, separate commit in two separate branches, which will generate um, a conflict. Why did I spend all this time to create this? Well, the cool thing about scripts is that once I automated this, the, this sequence of actions, I don't need to type them all over again every single time. So right now I have this folder structure and I can try to merge those commits together and then I can wipe everything out I can re-execute the script, re-have exactly the same situation, and then retest uh, maybe with rebasing instead of merging. So it's really, really convenient to know commands written on the command line instead of graphical user interfaces, because as I already mentioned uh, multiple times, whenever you can type anything on the terminal, well, then the computer can type anything on the terminal. If you can do something on the terminal, then that thing can be automated by the computer. By, for example, creating scripts, just like this one that I created. So if um, this commit structure is clear to you, I would like to try and see what happens if I try to git merge I'm currently on master because git log tells me that the head is pointing on master. So I would like to merge master with the branch called new feature, which is the other branch. What will happen? Last time it just worked and it created a new commit, which was the result of merging. But now we generated a, spe a special situation in which the commits will generate a conflict. Let's see what happens. Boom. Auto merging file txt. Oh, conflict on the content. Merge conflict in file txt. Automatic merge failed. Fix conflicts and then commit the results. So Git is telling me that he couldn't fix, or she couldn't fix the, com the, the this this merging by itself, and we have to fix these conflicts by ourselves. What does it mean to fix conflicts? Well, luckily it's not that difficult actually. Uh, if I do an ls, I see that there's the file that has the conflict. And if I look inside of the file, I will probably see something that is pretty different from what I expected. Here it is. So the first two lines are, well, similar to what I expected. The first two lines are hello world and look ma no hands. And that's cool. But then instead of having the third line, we have all this thing here. And what is this? Well, as you can see, it separates uh, two sections of the, same, of the same line, I can say. So here we start the head. This is what we have currently on our 
head on our on the brand on the master branch in this case and what we have uh, is the shells that she sells us seashells i'm sure but then through this separator you see that the other branch new feature instead has she sells seashells on the seashore so this is not what we want to commit we have to change this text file so we can uh, have whatever we we want so for example uh, we probably want to have this she sells seashells on the seashore above as the third line and then the shells that she sells are seashells i'm sure as the fourth line so i'm just going to cut and paste things um how do I cut and paste? I have no idea, but I'm looking here that Control K cuts and Control U pastes. I'm doing it right now, and apparently it works. So I'm not inventing anything. I'm just uh, doing exactly what it says. So if I if I am positive that this is the ending result, okay, I can save the file, I can quit from here, and I can resume the um, the merge if I like it like this, or otherwise I can do whatever I want to, to fix the conflict. So I'm going to do a control O to save the file, control X to quit the editor. And now what is the git status? Git status says that um, we have still a conflict situation and we can even abort the merge if we find any problems. But I think that we solve the conflict, so we can just git add everything. And what's the status right now? Okay, changes to be committed. All of conflicts were fixed, it says, but you are still merging. So use git commit to conclude the merge. Yes, I'm going to do it, git commit. And this is the standard message that we have whenever we are merging two branches together. And I can also uh, write something else. For example, merge branch new feature, fixing conflicts on line three or something like that. We can type whatever we want. Control O to save, Control X to exit the editor. And now everything is good. We can have a look again at the git log. And this is a conflict that was solved, that was fixed. We now have exactly what we expected, a new commit, which is the result of merging those two branches together, those two commits together. Want to try something else? Let's try something else. The cool thing about this folder is that I can completely wipe it out because I can immediately recreate it through the script. So I can already try something else. What I would like to try is what happens if I do this, not on the terminal, but on uh, an editor such as Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to add this git good folder inside of the workspace and I would like to show you this. This is the file that we have currently on which branch? Oh, pr probably it's too small. Which branch am I in? Well, I can see it from here on the bottom left. It says that I'm on branch master and if I want to switch from branch to branch, I can click on master and create new branch or just switch to another branch. So I'm going to t uh, click on new feature and this is the file that I have on new feature, which is different because look at that. She sells seashells on the seashore on this branch and if I switch back to master, it's the shells that she sells on seashells, I'm sure. So you see, they are two different branches and I can see the differences instantly by just switching from one to the other. Now that I'm on master, I would like to do the same thing that I was doing on the terminal. So merging master with the branch new feature. How do I do this? I have no idea, but I could try to open the command palette, which on Mac is command shift P and on Windows and Linux is control shift P. This is the command palette in which I can start typing what I want and then find the option that I would like. So what I would like is to do a merge. And in fact, I can see git merge branch. Hmm, sounds promising. So I'm going to probably click on this, git merge branch. I click on this and what should I merge it with? Is it with git good master or with inglorious portfolio main? 
Uh, oh, sorry, this is the repository because I have two repositories currently on the editor. So it's just asking me, yes, I want to branch, uh, I want to merge two branches, but from which repository? No, it's git good, it's git good. And now, what is the branch from which I would like to merge? Probably master, I don't know. No, it's exactly the same because I merged from master to master, sorry. So let's try again, git merge branch on git good and now I want to merge from new feature I'm sorry for that so I'm currently on master and I want to merge from new feature and if I click on here you see that we have well a similar situation from what we saw on the terminal it's just a little more advanced because it shows a different color scheme so you see that the head is green and the blue uh, and, and, the, and, and the other branch is uh, colored in blue. And we also have a couple of links here, which is accept the current change, so it will probably just keep the shells that she sells as seashells, I'm sure, or accept incoming change, which will probably keep she sells seashells on the seashore, or it can accept both changes and it will probably put place both lines one after the other, or you can compare the changes and... Uh, I'm curious about this because if you compare the changes, usually, yeah, it shows you uh, a different view in which you can compare the changes that you have on one side and the changes that you have on the other side. So it's a more advanced tool that allows you to better understand and fix those conflicts, okay? But usually I fix these conflicts uh, by hand. Uh, right now I'm going to try accept both changes. And as you can see, it just puts both uh, lines uh, one after the other. But they are not in the same exact order that I wanted. Actually, I wanted them inverted. I wanted she sells seashells on the seashore on the third line, and then the shells that she sells at seashells, I'm sure, on the fourth line. So right now, the only thing I can do is just, uh, uh, well, cut and paste, or since we are an advanced editor, we can use a shortcut called alt arrow up, arrow down, to move lines up and down. So this is the final result that I want. This is fine. I can now add this, um, uh, th this, uh, this change to the staging area. I can commit the change, and now the conflict is solved, exactly like it was on the terminal, okay? And what happens instead if I'm rebasing? No idea. Let's try. I really have no idea. So I'm going to remove once again this git good folder and I'm going to recreate it again with the script. So convenient. And now I'm going to try and rebase things. So I'm going inside of the git good. I still have my conflict, of course. Uh, let's see the git log. Are you with me or is it way too strange or too complicated? Please note that this is still advanced stuff that only the curious probably will, will enjoy. Um, one thing that I noticed, however, last week... Oh, it's cool, says Bobby, thanks. Um, one thing that I noted last week is that among my watchers, there are some experienced developers, even some of my former students that probably uh, saw, uh, enjoyed my lessons, even on Git. And... I heard that they feel this, uh, this lesson is a good rehearsal for them too. In fact, most of the times, developers never learned Git before going to their first job. So they learn on the job, they, are, they do some training on the job. There is someone that says, yeah, you have to click there and click there, and they have no idea what they are actually doing. So this boss that I'm that, that we are uh, facing right now this git boss is already a good superpower that I'm giving you because by now you know a lot more than some experienced developers that are currently using git on a in a real uh, workplace environment so congratulations you're already better than experienced developers in some in some aspects okay let's try uh, a rebasing so um, I'm on branch master and I would like to rebase new feature. So I will do git rebase new feature. Let's see what happens. 
Okay, so it's trying to auto merging the file, but there is a conflict and we have to change uh, and we have to continue, uh, we have to fix this conflict. So I'm going to nano the file. Nothing really uh, different here. Uh, the only difference probably is that here it's not written as the branch name, but it's the commit name and the commit message. But uh, other than that, it's exactly the same thing. I also see that the, the lines are in the correct order already, which is a, a side effect of rebasing probably. So I'm just going to, you know, uh, remove every part that I don't like. So for example, this head part, this separator part, and this other part here. This is exactly what I want. So I'm going to save it, I'm going to exit. And what's the situation currently? Git status. Okay, I need to add the file. What's the status now? I need to probably commit, git commit. And this is the this is a, a different commit message. As you can see, add another tongue twister is the message that we had in the commit number three, let's say. So commit zero, one, two, three. This was commit three. And it's good, it's true. Um, it's exactly what we wanted. Because if you remember what rebasing is about, let's go back to the slide that shows you what rebasing is about. Okay, so what rebasing is about is not adding a new commit, but it's reverting the commit from our extra branch, in this case it's the experiment branch, and reapplying the commit after any commit that we have on master. In this case we only have one commit, which is C3. So I expect C4 prime to be a kind of different commit, because it's not exactly like C4. It's C4 plus all the changes that I already have in C3. But still, I think that the message should be the same because, well, the message is saying add another tongue twister. And in fact, the commit that we had actually added another tongue twister. So it, it's, a, it's, a proper, it's a proper commit message. The cool thing about rebasing is the fact that it doesn't create any extra commit and it keeps the um, it keeps the, the history, the log, clean as a straight line without having all these uh, paths, um, parallel paths that merge together. So this is a good, uh, very good commit message. This is a good news for me. So I'm going to save it, close it, and what happens now? Okay, there's uh, still, something, um, still something wrong here. What happens? Well, in rebasing, apparently, I also need to do this, git rebase continue once you are satisfied with your changes. Let's do this and then I'll show you why it is. Git rebase continue. Successfully rebased and updated refs heads master. So git status says that branch master is clean. And if I do a git log, I will see that the history is now completely straight and it's clean, and it's exactly what I wanted. But why did I have to do a git rebase continue while well, the merge didn't uh, expect to have this continue thing? Well, the reason is that this is a, a very simple situation in which on master you just had commit C3. But what if you have commit C5? Well, in that case, Rebase, what it does is that it reverts commit C4 and it reapplies that commit in every single commit that you have on master. So in this case, we only have C3. But if we had C3 and C5, then commit C4 will be applied to C3 and then to C5. Okay, so that's why we need to git rebase continue because git expects you to apply the same commit the commit C4, to every single commit that it will face on branch master. Luckily here we've got only one commit on branch master, so we're already good to go. But especially when you have conflicts, rebasing could be a little more difficult because you have to fix conflicts in every single commit that you have on branch master. I know that it's a little complicated. It's complicated for advanced 
experienced Git users. So don't worry, it's complicated for me. Of course it is. Don't worry about that. But it's still something that I wanted to tell you. And one last thing about Git, and then I'm not going to talk about it anymore, is are there any best practices about Git commit messages? Because I already told you that every time you commit, you can write whatever you want. But still, it's better to follow some good conventions. For example, this beautiful, um, this beautiful comic by XKCD shows you how usually Git commits. Well, just they, uh, they, they get worse and worse the more time you spend on them. So you start with a good commit message, such as created main loop and timing control. Then you do enabled config file parsing. And then you do a lot of bug fixes. So you don't want to just explain all the bug fixes that you practice and you say mis mis miscellaneous bug fixes. And then you add something and you change something else and you start writing code addition edits. And then more code, here you have code, ah, 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 because you are forced to write a commit message. You cannot just keep it blank. So you have to type anything. ADK, blah, 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 blah. my hands are typing words, hands. As a project drags on, my git commit messages get less and less informative. This is what we would like to avoid. So let's try to always write good commit messages that have a meaning. Um, so, this, this is a very good um, post that I would really suggest you to read. So you know what? I'm going to share it with you on Slack. And uh, it shows you why commit messages are important. Well, first of all, commit messages show you the story of your code. And not only, if you at a certain point need to revert back to some changes or if you want to inspect what you did uh, some time ago, well, commit messages will definitely help you find what you need uh, in the Git log pretty easily. So that's why this thing here is completely unintelligible, but this thing here is much better. So this is re-adding configuration post-processor tests after its brief removal in R814, and then I have to scroll. Ignore ing the test. Whoa, this is really, really long and difficult to read. And what happens with this? Fix two build breaking issues, plus revert the class metadata reading advisor to revert what? There's a lot of other stuff. And then tweaks to packaging for Java files. Okay, but which tweaks? I would like to know which tweaks were there. And consolidated util and mutable annotation utils classes into, okay. Polishing, what, what did you polish? So if you compare it with this other uh, git log, fix failing composite property source test. Okay, this was a fix to some tests that were failing. Rework property source early parsing logic. Okay, whatever it means. Add tests for import selector metadata. Okay, it added some tests. Update docbook dependency and generate epub. Okay, polish Mokito usage. Oh, so this is what was uh, polishing. It was pol polishing Mokito usage. So uh, I don't know what this code is about and I don't know what composite property source tests is, but still, I understand. it's really easy to read these lines because they are short and they are telling you exactly what is, what is happening in this log. Um, so there are some rules, well, rules, rules of thumb, of course. And uh, these are the rules that I probably suggest you because I, I use them all the time. And you probably will see that I follow some or all of these rules. So, for example, first of all, you need to separate the subject from the body with a blank line. So, as I already told you, when you, whenever you create a commit, you have to type something. That something can be um, a, a title, but you can also type a lot more, a body of the commit. So, whenever you do a git commit dash m, so the, you are just uh, writing the title of the commit. But if you open the editor, if you open nano to edit your commit message, then you can write some title and then separate it by a blank line. You can type 
whatever you want. You can type complex stuff, um, paragraphs, links, um, lists of things, uh, whatever you need to, to tell to the next user, which usually is yourself. And when you git log, without one line, of course, you will see all the details of this commit, including the title and the body that you created. But if you do a git log one line, then you will just see the title. So in the body, you put extra information that if anybody wants to see them, they can still see them. But you separate the body, so in case you just want to see the title, with git log one line, you just see the title, okay? Oh, there's also a git short log, which I didn't know about, which is pretty cool. Um, limit the subject line to 50 characters. So this is the title, the subject. Just limit it to 50 characters. If it's more than 50 characters, you will probably at a certain point need to scroll horizontally, which is something that you don't want to happen because it makes reading commit messages more difficult. So just limit yourself to 50 characters. How do you know if there are 50 characters or, or, or more than that? Well, the cool thing is that Visual Studio Code tells you um, if, you are, if you exceed its 50 characters. Let me show you. So I'm going to remove again this git good. I'm going to recreate everything. And I'm going to add the folders to the workspace. And I'm going to merge the two branches. Oops. Oh, come on. Okay. So in Git Good, I'm going to merge new feature. And we have conflicts, of course. I'm going to fix those conflicts. And I'm going to fix them the way that I want to. And then here, I'm going to type a commit message. So if the commit message is hello, nothing happens. But if I say hello world, I'm going to commit this merge that is very long. At a certain point, you will see that Visual Studio Code gives you this hint. Hey, you exceeded the 50 lines by 11 characters. Okay, so you can, I don't know, remove these. And now the commit message is long enough, but it's not a good commit message. So I'm not going to, to type it like this. Let's see why. Okay, subject, 50 characters at most. Um, oh, this is what happens, for example, on GitHub. So if you do 50 characters, everything is good. But if you start with uh, 72 characters or even more, then you will see that on GitHub, you will not even be able to see all the message. You will have to, it will be truncated, which is pr pretty bad. It's unreadable like this, right? So 50 characters is the soft limit, and you should always try to stay in the 50 characters. 72 apparently is the hard limit. You n should never go uh, beyond this, um, th this limit. Then, capitalize the subject line. It is much better if you type accelerate to 88 miles per hour with a capital A instead of with a lowercase a. Why is that? Well, there's not real, a real reason here, but just remember that a commit message is pretty much a, a, a title for something. So, titles usually are capitalized. They stand out more. Do not end the subject line with a period. So. Since this is a title, you never end titles with the period. You are wasting an extra character. So just, just type as if, if, as if it was the title of a newspaper. Use the imperative mood in the subject line. This is something that I usually do, and I see lots of people not doing this. Lots of people prefer to use the past tense. So they say, merged two branches together. And that's true, because you merge two branches together. So you are recording what you've done in the, in the commit message. But still, um, for a couple of reasons, we prefer instead to use the imperative form. Hey, dude, hey, git, merge these two branches together. I did not do it. You are doing it. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's because we, we spare some extra characters. So we can type longer uh, git commit messages if we use the, uh, the imperative mode. And also for a philosophical uh, reason, um, let me see. Yeah, you're following Git's uh, own built-in conventions. 
Um, let me see. Writing this way can be a little awkward at first. We're more used to speaking in the indicative mood, which is about reporting facts. That's why you commit messages often end up reading like this. I fixed a bug with Y, or a changing behavior of X. And sometimes commit messages get written as a description of their context. So more fixes for broken stuff, or sweet new API methods. So this is this doesn't even have a verb. It's just what the commit holds right? What the commit contains inside of it. But um, this is what Git and GitHub usually suggests. Uh, you start your sentence if, with, if applied, this commit will blah blah blah. So this will give you a reason to say, to, to, to type a commit message such as refactor subsystem x for readability or update getting started documentation, remove deprecated methods, etc, etc, instead of uh, fixed bug with y, which doesn't work. If applied, this commit will fixed bug. No, will fix the bugs. But this is probably a soft rule. I see so many people using the past tense or maybe even small changes as a commit message. But I usually use this um, this imperative mode. And I think that Git does it too. In fact, the commit message of any merge is usually merge with branch blah blah blah. So for example, merge with branch feature, what was that, new feature. Or probably even merge branch new feature, merge new feature branch, I don't know. So it's an imperative thing. And by default from Git. Uh, sixth rule, wrap the body at 72 characters. Okay, you know already, the commit message is the title and it should usually uh, be 50 characters, no more than that. The body can be a little larger and the hard, uh, well, the, the, the soft uh, limit is 72. Never go beyond the 80 characters. And this is important also in coding. You should never go um, over 80 characters because otherwise you will probably need to scroll horizontally the, the file which makes it really really hard to, to read and to write the file itself. And finally, this is really important, use the body to explain what and why versus the how. Um, I would probably say another thing, uh, use, the, use the message to explain the why instead of the how. So for example, uh, let me let me show you the commit messages that I created. Oh, okay, yeah, let's do it like this. Let me show you the messages that I created here. So, apart from the initial commit, which is probably pretty standard, it's the it's it's the only commit that I accept that doesn't have a verb in imperative form. But here we've got add some more text. So I'm explaining what I'm doing. And here I'm explaining what kind of text I'm adding, add a tongue twister. And here I'm saying add another tongue twister, which is, is not, um, um, it, it's not describing exactly what I'm doing. It's describing why I'm doing this. I could have uh, written add string on line three. But what does this mean? Of course, I know that I added the string on line three. And if I look at the code, that was inside of this commit, I will see that there is a new string of text on line three. So the commit is not giving me any new information about that. So I would like to instead to specify why did I add a string on line three? Well, I added a new string on line three because I wanted to add a new tongue twister. So this commit will be add another tongue twister. I know that it's pretty stupid as an example, but um, you will see uh, when we are dealing with real code, it's no use to say add class, add um, or change file. I know that you changed the file, but why did you change the file? What, what was your purpose? Did you improve the search engine optimization of that file? Did you improve responsiveness? Did you update the theme of your website? What did you do? So the commit should tell you why you changed files. What was your purpose? Okay. And in this website, it, show, it tells this about the body. But I think that it's uh, pretty important for the subject too, also for the commit message. And then we've got some tips and that's it. So this is everything that I wanted to tell you about Git. From now on, we'll just use Git as if we are masters of Git. So we'll just use Git add, Git commit and Git push.
And that's it. Let's go back to business. And let's go back to HTML. Okay, so as I already told you, this part is pretty strange because it will be just a, a long, long list of uh, features of HTML and CSS. Uh, most of them are so trivial that I don't feel like spending too much time in trying them with you because you can try them by yourselves and uh, it will be really, really easy for you to do that. Um, maybe for the most complex features, we will do some exercise together. And uh, it's not programming. This is not programming. Programming means using a programming language such as JavaScript, which we will start as soon as we finish this part with HTML and CSS. This is not programming, but still, after you successfully completed the lessons about HTML and CSS, you will already be hireable by someone. Because, you know, there is a, a gap between two kinds of roles in every company that uses IT. There is the gap between the designers, which design beautiful websites on, uh, on software such as Adobe XD or InVision and stuff like that, and they draw these beautiful designs. And then we've got programmers that deal with the logic, with all the, uh, the complex stuff, the complex part. But there is a gap in between because designers don't want to dirty their hands by writing HTML and CSS code because ooh, it's code, it's not art. And programmers don't want to dirty their hands in dealing with HTML and CSS because they're not real programming language. That's too easy. That's something that a designer should do. So after you finish these lessons between HTML and CSS, you could bridge the gap. You could be that person that is able to translate the beautiful design that designers create into beautiful HTML and CSS code. And when I say beautiful, I mean that, yes, it reflects the beautiful design, but you will also be able to write good code, clean code, that will be very easy for the programmers to then uh, integrate in their code base. So there is this um, uh, discipline of the HTML and CSS developer, which sometimes I think is uh, underrated, but I think it's a beautiful discipline because it's exactly in between uh, between the art and the engineering. You are using your creativity, but you're also starting to use logic. And there are so many ways to write bad code in HTML and CSS, and there are so few ways to write beautiful code in HTML and CSS. And this is what I would like to, uh, you know, focus on. Not just writing HTML and CSS. You already know how to do that, actually. We did it on the crash course. We're going to try and write beautiful HTML and CSS, if we can. So, well, the background is that HTML is the language of the browser and nothing more than that. Well, it started like that, but now um, JavaScript became so huge as a, a language due to um, Spider Monkey, which was an extension for Firefox that allowed to change some JavaScript in your web page and due to Node.js, which is the JavaScript runtime that allows you to r run JavaScript outside of the browser. So now HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, I can still call them the web languages, the languages of the web, but it doesn't mean that they are only applied to the web. You can actually use these languages in every situation, even to create apps or even to create desktop applications. In fact, I don't know if I told you already, but there are so many desktop applications that we are currently using right now, which are actually created with web languages. Visual Studio Code is created with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. TypeScript, but still JavaScript. So the languages of the web are really, really important nowadays to build anything, not just the web. Bobby says HTML is everything but beautiful. I agree. I completely agree. It's not beautiful. But um, yeah, as a language, it's not beautiful. There are some languages that you can use that transpile, as we say, into HTML, if you prefer a better language. Um, but still, yeah, I can agree that HTML per se, with all these tags, it is not really, really nice. And um, if you're curious, I will show you some alternatives that don't allow you to just uh, uh, skip HTML, but you can write um, a different language that will turn into HTML. So, 
Luckily, we've got browsers such as these ones that I listed here, Chrome, Firefox, Edge. Edge has become a pretty good browser now. Safari, Opera, uh, Vivaldi, Brave browser, the Matrix browser, of course, not Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer is probably what, um, what prevented JavaScript and the HTML technologies to, uh, to advance quickly. But then, as soon as we dropped support for Internet Explorer, we went really, really fast. Um, we will see how to write and view HTML, but we already know that. We will see how to debug HTML, but we already know that. We will also see how to learn from others, which means we can inspect other people's websites and steal from them, right? So, we already know lots of things about the basic tags. I already showed you how to create headings with the H1 tag. We already know how to do paragraphs with the P tag. We probably know something about formatting, but I'm going to tell you again. So let's go back to our portfolio. And I'm going to prepare the terrain. So Crash Course, you know what? I'm going to rename Crash Course into 00-Crash Course. Why am I typing it like this? Uh, because I'm expecting to create multiple folders and I would like to keep them in order. And the best way to keep folders in order is to put some numbering uh, in front of them. But why zero, zero and not just zero or one? Well, the reason is that computers, operating systems usually sort folders and files alphabetically. So there's a strange thing happening in which if you think that the right order for numbers is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, well, you're completely right because these are, uh, this is the way numbers are uh, sorted numerically from 1 to 10 or from 0 to 10 if you want. Okay, let's do one. Uh, but alphabetically, if you had to put these numbers on a vocabulary, on a dictionary, um, then the situation is a little bit different because, for example, you would have uh, Abbey before Amazon and Amazon before Bobby. <laughs> this lesson is all in your honor. Uh, so, Abbey, Amazon, and Bobby. As you can see, you put everything that's... Oh, Every word that starts with an A before every word that start with a, with a B. So if you look at these numbers and you see them as letters instead of numbers, well then, in that case, you would have one, which is the first number, which is the first word, and then right after this, you will put 10, not two, because this is a word that starts with one. And one, alphabetically, is a word that's before the, the number, the letter two. So, alphabetically, you will probably see this kind of ordering. How do you solve this thing? Well, pretty easy. If you put a zero before every number, like this, then the ordering will be preserved, because you are putting every word that starts with zero before every word that starts with one, alphabetically speaking, okay? So this is what I'm doing. I'm expecting not to have more than 99 folders, so I need two characters, and I put zero, zero, and then it will be zero, one, zero, two, zero, three, and if I reach 10, 10 will not be the second element, it will be the last element of the list, okay? So... <laughs> I don't know if this was trivial for you. Uh, probably it wasn't trivial for some, hope, hope, hopefully. Okay, so this is already um, a change that I did on my, uh, on my portfolio, so I can commit it, I can uh, add all the changes, and I can say that um, add folder numbering to preserve sorting. Maybe it's too big. Okay, no, a Visual Studio Code is not telling me that it exceeds 50 uh, characters. So I think that this line is good enough. Add folder numbering to preserve sorting. As you can see, I didn't just say change the folder name. I'm saying why I'm changing the folder name, okay? So I added everything. I control enter to, to perform the commit. This is way too small. 
and I'm going to push everything and I can push in multiple ways. I can push from here or I can push here from the bottom left. Um, remember, pushing means that every change that I create locally, every commit that I created locally is now going to be synchronized on the remote repository. I don't know why I still have this git good. I don't want it. Close repository. Okay. So now that we've got all of this, I'm going to create a new folder, which is called 01 dash html because in this folder we're going to do to create all our experiments about html and hopefully we will have also a 02 in which we will do experiments on css so 01 html i'm going to create a new file and uh, i don't know what name to give i'll probably call it basic tags okay just like the title of this slides uh, of this slide new file and i can use the same convention if i want 00, zero basic tags.html. This way I still preserve the order of the files that I'm creating. This is an HTML file and of course from now from here you can start typing code with me. Um, I'm going to slow a little bit, slow down a little bit so you can, uh, uh, you, you can follow me. Uh, but as always if I'm going too fast, if you're not um, sure of what I'm doing, just, just tell me. In the meantime, I'm going to look at Slack if you by chance create an anything. No, no problems at all. Okay. This was really, really fast for me. Um, I create, I changed the name of the folder. I created a new folder. I used a different uh, convention for numbering. I created this HTML file. Remember that the file should be HTML, not HMTL, because it's hyper text mockup language. And if you call it HMTL, it's it's not the same thing. You have to be as accurate as possible. And also, if you type it correctly, then this is automatically recognized as an HTML file from the editor. So I can start typing HTML and the editor is already giving me some suggestions, some very important suggestions. For example, HTML colon 5 apparently is the abbreviation that allows me to create all of this boilerplate. And if you saw it, it's called an Emmet abbreviation. What is Emmet? Well, if you're curious about that, I'm going to tell you so you have all the time to, uh, to follow along. Um, if you want to know what Emmet is, well, Emmet is a language. I don't know if you, if you can call it a language. Actually, probably, yeah, it's a plugin that you can add to editors and we already have it. Uh, automatically added on Visual Studio Code. And this plugin allows you to type some uh, ultra fast um, shortcuts in order to achieve uh, what you want in HTML. So, for example, HTML colon 5 is a shortcut that allows you to just type everything here. If you happen to be in this situation here, in which I t typed HTML colon 5 and I don't have the suggestions, well, you remember that in the terminal, you can use tab to get the suggestions, but here the tab has a different meaning, so it doesn't work. What you can do on an editor is to use instead command space or control space on the other operating system. Uh, if you do control space or command space, it usually opens this, this thing called IntelliSense which means that it's uh, automatic suggestions, intelligent suggestions based on the, where you are placed. So this is actually a list of, of all the things that you can select and the list contains only one thing. So I'm going to press enter and now you've got this uh, boilerplate of HTML. And this boilerplate is already uh, focusing on device width, scale 1.0 and document. We don't care about all of this. I'm going to type basic tags here uh, in the title and then we can focus on the body. You remember? The body is the only place where we put visible stuff while the head contains invisible stuff. The title will be actually visible but it will just be visible as the name of the tab it's the label of the tab on the browser. It's not visible inside of the page. Okay, I'm going pretty fast on this because you already practice a lot, right? So, headings. 
How do you create headings? H1 or H2 or H3. This is a heading. And you can create another heading like this. This is a subheading or whatever you want. And then you can create paragraphs. So this is a paragraph. And as you can see, I'm using the convention for which headings do not have any uh, punctuation marks. Well, this is a paragraph, it's a paragraph, so I'm putting a dot at the end of it, a full stop. And uh, what about formatting? Uh, you will see that the reference code that I put in these slides is not really complete. In fact, we are going to uh, go a little past these tutorials. I started with Ryan's tutorials, but then I moved to something else when uh, dealing with CSS. I don't remember which one was it, but we'll see in a while. And um, it is good, but it's not enough. So about formatting, um, I already told you a little bit of this. Well, the fact is that if I put a break line here, this has completely no meaning in HTML. This will still be um, seen as one space. And this is convenient for us because this way we can uh, stay inside of the 80 characters. So we can say this is a long very long oh so long so long it is painful omg please make it stop okay so this is a very long a long very long oh so long so long it's painful oh my god please make it stop paragraph i don't want to scroll horizontally here so what i can do is to put it on a new line here and now I can see everything without scrolling but still when you see this on the browser you will not see this new line it's just convenient for us okay so um, you can put whatever spaces you want uh, one thing that I noticed however is a configuration that I have to probably switch off which is ligatures what are ligatures uh, I put a fancy font on this editor that allows me to treat some uh, special characters as if they were only one character in fact you probably saw something similar to this I put um, an equal sign and a greater than sign and it looks like an arrow this is a ligature and uh, since it can be confusing for you guys I'm going to turn off ligatures just for you look how okay look how I nullify myself for you right okay so formatting no is the connection lost again PNTM says that the connection is lost again. Can anybody confirm? OMG. Think so, yes. Oh, okay, I'm going to close this again and we'll start in uh, two seconds. <laughs> 